Father, we are so excited to be together this morning. Lord, what a great morning we have together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to just creatively tell what you've done in our lives through some stories and testimony and creative words. Lord, we just honor you this morning. We say thank you for all that you've done in our lives and in our midst. We bring you our words as part of our worship this morning. We welcome your presence always, Holy Spirit. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you folks here in the room today and with our online community this morning. I love this particular Sunday. We didn't really get to do it last year because of COVID, so I'm super excited. I feel like we get a double dose of sharing with our family. Uh, Many of you know about Emerge. We're going to hear from some of you this morning that have been a a part of our Emerge Discipleship Intensive that we have here at The Stirring. For those watching online and those in the room that might not know what Emerge is, we offer an eight-month discipleship intensive here at The Stirring, and our whole hope for it is just growth. We love the idea and the opportunity to come alongside people individually in the context of mentoring and small groups and community and just empower one another to grow, to find a breakthrough, to to gain momentum in your relationship with the Lord and in your relationships with others, to gain some depth, to gain maturity. Not that any of us are ever immature, but we're all growing into maturity, right? Uh, The Lord's always growing us and always inviting us into that journey. So Emerge is really an intimate relational journey of growth and gaining, uh, gaining maturity and perspective in the Holy Spirit as He works in our lives. So this morning, we're gonna get to hear from four of our Emerge students this year. And I wanna tell you a little bit about Emerge, mostly for the benefit of our online family. We have four things that we really wrap Emerge around. Maybe, maybe you might call them values, but the first one is growth. We really value being able to come alongside the individual and just empower them in their growth, their, their, their growth in the Lord, their growth in faith, their growth in community, their growth in character, their growth in spiritual formation. And we, we've structured Emerge in such a way that you get to just be where you're at. So we get to walk alongside the individual. Everybody gets to be uh, where they're at and we get, the, we get to just walk with you and the Holy Spirit as, as you grow at the pace that God's working in your life. The second thing that we really value is authenticity. We want everybody, our leadership team included and emerged to just get the space to be wholeheartedly who you are. Um, and, and so we invite people into that place of authenticity. We encourage it. We, we kind of spur it on in one another. But with authenticity, we also reach for some vulnerability because you can be authentically you and you can be wholeheartedly you, uh, but I still might not know too much about the depths of who you are. And so there is a place in Emerge where we, as we partner with each other and we walk with one another in the power of the Holy Spirit, we put push for some deeper places and we push for authenticity and we crack open our lives with one another um, and allow the Holy Spirit to get in and and kind of mine the depths of who we are, bring healing, bring breakthrough, bring freedom into the places of our story that he's wanting to address. And the last thing, but I think the most significant thing is hospitality. We really value radical hospitality and emerge. And that looks like just creating space. We have leaders that live literally create space in their homes for small groups, mentoring, um, but, but the, there's a hospitality of heart where everybody is welcome and everybody is safe and there's a value given for who you are and where you're at. And so this morning, you're going to get to hear from four of our students some creative retellings of what God has done in their life this year. Uh, It's a mix of testimony and story and spoken word. Some of it is deeply personal. Some of it is just, again, a creative reflection of what God's done in their life. And so I'm excited that you get to hear from them this morning. Sound good? All right, here we go. First up, Laura, why don't you come? This is our sweet little friend, Laura, who has a powerful creative gift in her life. And uh, she wrote this spoken word for us about some of the things God's done recently. (laughs) 
shame, fear, insecurity, doubt. Why do I let these roll in my life when I'm meant to wear a crown? As a daughter of the king, you would think I would have this down by now. Oh, there's another. Self-hatred tells me I will never recover. God, I don't want any of these in my life anymore. I just want all you have planned for, not the world, not all this found in the swirl of life. And yet I know I can't reach beyond these in my own might. But God, I am ready for lasting change. So please just rearrange it all. To my knees in humility, I will fall. But how many more times will it take for your love to truly sink in? When you call me precious daughter, again and again and again and again. How did these barriers grow so dense? How have I even survived this long like this? God, you are the only answer. With all the love of a father piercing my heart over and over, you tell me to push through too, but this is no Red Rover. It's so much more than a physical running through, and in every way I truly want to be new. But these barriers, God, what do I do? Because you say that I am new, but I can't help thinking, how is that true? See how quickly my heart still falls away from you? Yet God, I know you are never really gone and neither am I. And in the darkness, you only grow my wings so that I can actually begin to fly. You remind me of truth no matter how often I forget. You send new opportunities for the things that I miss. You call me by name. You tell me what to claim. To push through beyond all the barriers, God, your love already made a way. It's just something I have to keep walking day by day until my heart finally understands and deep in my soul, it truly lands. You are father, not just friend. And your love for me will never end. Yeah. That's amazing. Good job. Well done. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Laura. That was beautiful. Awesome. So next we have Ryan. Ryan's got a word for us this morning. Well, I will just say this about Emerge. It has been so life giving for me this last year. Uh, so at one point we were given an attribute of God to study. And really this for me is what was kind of birthed, kind of a culmination out of what Amy talked about in the kind of dredging the depths and pulling everything out and what, what God has really shown me in myself. Uh, so I'm gonna jump right in. My attribute was immutable. And immutable doesn't mean that God is quiet or you can, that you can mute him. It's actually that he doesn't change. Uh, James 1.17 puts it this way. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming from God who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. So what I want to do is I want to quickly focus on relationship and hope. This might sound a little strange, but I want to look at Jesus and Judas and that relationship and kind of what it shows us. Because when we look at it, uh, I think it shows us a tragically beautiful look into mankind and humans and God. Now, God is a relational God. He called Judas into relationship with him. He was a disciple. He was one of the 12. He walked with Jesus. When you read the New Testament and what Jesus was doing, Judas was there. But it's not in the moment of betrayal that actually got me when I really studied the story of Judas. It's, it's not the kiss. It's not the ear being cut off and the healing. It's not Jesus being led away to the cross. It's what Jesus said to Judas when he walked up to betray Jesus. Matthew 26, 50 says, but Jesus said to him, My friend, 
go ahead and do what you've come to do. Jesus called Judas his friend. In that moment, everything they've been through, Jesus knowing what he was there for, the first words he said to him were, my friend. Pretty crazy stuff. Now, whether it's Judas, we're looking at Peter, we're looking at Jacob, we're looking at Mary Magdalene, any of these stories, we can look throughout the Bible and see that God is a relational God that he desires, he craves relationship with his creation. Jesus didn't look at Peter and be like, peace out, dude, you're the one that's gonna deny me three times when push comes to shove. No, he called him in and he took him on a wild adventure anyways. Circumstances didn't dictate God's desire for relationship with any of these people. His love and connectedness did. Circumstances don't dictate God's desire for relationship with you. God's love and connectedness do. So real quickly, I want to look at hope because there's also amazing hope here. If Jesus, the one who would betray Jesus, the one who would sell his soul for 30 pieces of silver is still knowingly brought into relationship with Jesus. And remember, he's unchanging. He doesn't change. Then for us today, there is nothing you could have done and nothing you could do that would ever disqualify you from a relationship with Jesus, with God. I want to read that again because this is really where the meat, this is really where I felt the heart of God was in this, was actually that there's nothing that you could do or that you will do or have done that will ever disqualify you from a relationship with him. Now remember, If God changed and got better, it means that he wasn't perfect before. If God changed and got worse, it means he isn't perfect now. Well, we know God is perfect and therefore he really doesn't need anything. So I'm giving you even more hope. He still created us. He still wants relationship with us. Remember, he doesn't need it. He wants it. In his immutableness, he chose us. You are worthy. You are loved, you are a friend of God, you're a daughter of God, you're a son of God. That never, ever changes, period. Mm -hmm. Ever, it doesn't change. Thank you, sir. sir. Awesome. And now we're going to hear from the lovely Christina Franson. Christina's been a part of the story for a long time. How long? How many years? Eight years. And uh, Christine is a mother of two wild children and wife to Luke. And uh, she is brilliant. Let me just tell you, she's brilliant. And so I'm so excited we get to hear some of the things Christine has learned in Emerge. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm a planner. I love event planning, menu planning, wedding planning. Um, I just love lists and details and and getting all those things to work together um, into one beautiful product. But the problem with planning, of course, is that you don't always know that it's going to turn out the way you're planning. Um, All is well when things go exactly as planned, but that rarely happens. So um, at some point, I reach my limit of what I can control, and I fear not reaching the expectations of myself and others. And that's when worry breaks in. Uh, there's joy in the planning, but that, that joy is, is really lost when um, I start to worry. And, and um, worry is the thief of joy. Let me play this out for you in a little picture of my daily life. Say I'm hosting a dinner party. Um, I invite the guests and we set the date and I start to plan the, the meal and when I'm going to prepare the day of the dinner party comes and my husband decides to make a spontaneous, really sweet hot breakfast for us. But there's this uh, knot in my stomach when I see this new pile of dirty dishes that I didn't expect. And um, he goes to work. I go grocery shopping with the kids, and um, which always takes a little longer. <laughs> then um, come home and um, 
eat lunch, put my daughter down for a nap, and start cleaning. Um, so I finally start to tackle those dirty dishes and my mom calls, and she's got exciting news. She wants to share every detail with me, and, um, but I'm looking at the dishes going, oh, they're still not getting done. So I interrupt her and I say, hey, I gotta go and um, finish the dishes and I'm ready to tackle the food now and like start to prepare. And my daughter wakes up feeling clingy. All she wants is to be held by mom. And I'm thinking of the time. I, I don't have the time for this. So um, I put her down and she bursts into tears. Meanwhile, my son just wants to play with cars and trucks. So he dumps his entire toy box on the ground and I yell at him, like, I just cleaned this house. <laughs> so uh, I quickly, frantically pick everything up and set them in front of a show. And um, I finish all the prep, the guests arrive, the food um, was ready on time, the meal goes well, and everyone seems to enjoy themselves. So was my plan a success? Well, my means for achieving the perfect dinner party was worry. And that worry always stole the joy, the joy of the moment. Um, when I was worried about the dirty dishes, I missed the joy of having a wonderful meal prepared for me. When I was worried about how long my mom was gonna talk on the phone, I missed the joy of having a mom who cares to connect with me. When when I worried about my daughter and how long she wanted to be held, I, I missed the joy of sweet baby snuggles. And when I w was worried about my son and the mess he was making, I missed the joy of my son feeling loved and pursued by his mom. Worry really is the, the thief of joy. And um, so how do we break this broken cycle? And the very first step is to recognize that it's broken. In Matthew 6, 27, Jesus says to his disciples, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his life? So I need to admit that even with all of my worry, it didn't contribute to a better outcome for me. It was wasted energy. And what's more, um, I'm, I'm affecting my family relationships. My children are growing up in the atmosphere that, that I create. Um, they're my little disciples and they're learning to do life from me. If I um, value outcomes over people, they will too. If I choose anxiety as a way of life, they're gonna follow me in that. Um, so the, the next step to breaking this broken cycle of worry is to let go of my illusion of control. Um, it, is it natural for someone to default to worry when circumstances are out of their control? Absolutely. But I don't have to live like that. Right. I've put my faith in Christ. Right. There's a ton of things that are out of my control, but there is nothing out of his. So in, in verses 32 and 33, Jesus says, the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's a promise. We can all claim that promise. He's promising us good outcomes when he's, we seek his kingdom first and put his righteousness first. So what does that look like? Well, in my planning, it looks like walking by faith. And every time something unexpected comes up, I need to bring it to him. And it also means that I'm loving those that he's put right in front of me. So today I declare to walk by faith in my planning. And um, I'm not gonna let worry steal my joy anymore. So I hope you will all graciously hold me to that and I invite you to join me in it. So thank you. And finally today, we're gonna hear from Aaron. And Aaron has a great testimony. Uh, this is probably way too short to hear all the wonder of what God's been doing in his life. But Aaron, why don't you come and share with us what's on your heart? Like a fire was our 24-hour out loud Bible reading. 
in my section of the Bible were the Psalms 128 to 150. And my assignment or hot topic for this time was what, what impacts you in, in those Psalms. Um, as I was reading, I didn't like really what impacted me. I didn't like it at all, but that was the assignment. And with the help of my mentor, I dug into it. So what impacted me the most was Psalm 137, 7 to 9. I'm going to read that for you. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against rocks. Okay, show of hands. <laughs> Let's be honest with ourselves for just a moment. Have you ever been mad at someone? Okay, what about real seeing red mad at someone? Now, have you ever been so angry you wanted to physically hurt someone or yourself? Was your need for revenge so great that you could see yourself committing a mortal sin? Have you cried out to God to take vengeance on your behalf? Now, I could have taken the easy way out, right? I could have picked any of the many psalms that sing the praises of our Lord and wrote about how moved I am and how good it is to give thanks to the Lord. But I kept coming back to this psalm and this verse. Obviously, this is what I'm supposed to dive into. So at the end, I prayed. God spoke and I listened. I heard God speak to me. Very clearly, he said, you've been that angry yourself plenty of times. I was offended. I was offended at myself. But my offense was unwarranted. God so wonderfully reminded me that I've done these very same things. When I was a child, my stepdad would punish me by making me grab my ankles, stand in front of the couch, and then I would be beaten with a belt till I couldn't stand. He was a logger. I used to wish for him to have a work uh, accident at work and die, not come home. When I would have lies yelled and screamed at me in my past relationships, I would wish that person would get into a car accident and die and not make it home. The boys that uh, molested me as a child used to get maimed by wolves in my daydreams. The problem is I wasn't crying out to God like the psalmist was. I was begging for the same things, but I didn't know forgiveness. I didn't know how to pray. I only knew how to hate and be angry, and I was so good at it. Now, as I've been studying, I've learned that David's hatred for his enemies came from his love for God. David thought his enemies were God's enemies, so his desire for God's justice was not a personal vendetta. My intentions had never been that pure. My desires were placed in the hands of the enemy. My desire for what I thought was justice was one of selfishness. I didn't know how to forgive, nor did I want to. Now, I'd like to think I'm not that person anymore. I've been saved. I was baptized in this very space in 2018. I forgave my stepdad on the day I eulogized him. Through my work in Emerge, I've forgiven my ex and myself for my past failures, and I've moved forward. We've started my life over with an amazing godly woman, and together we've created a home of worship for our family. I'm stepping into sonship. I love the Lord, and I'm learning to be in relationship with him. I'm in this amazing church with the best community of people ever. The problem was I still carry these thoughts with me, they were emotional baggage that I thought was unpacked, but they still reared their ugly head when I was triggered. So how does one call themselves a Christian and still carry around that much hate? Why after when I thought I've forgiven, does this crap still hang around? Why was I so bothered by a desperate cry to God for justice? My identity was warped, that's why. It was still wrapped up in shame. Shame put there by the enemy to keep me from reaching my full potential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you go. And then I had a victory. 
Jim's final mention to our emerge class was from the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2.1. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. Well, what is my watch? While meditating on this, I clearly heard God say, it's not my job to carry this anger anymore. Yeah. Yes, the abuses of the past happened to me, but they're not who I am. I will not allow them to define me any longer. My identity is no longer wrapped up in my past. Who am I? I'm a son of God, first and foremost. God is much stronger than I can ever be. He can carry this anger for me. So I'm gonna let him, I'm gonna give it to him. All the hate, shame, and anger of my past, I'm gonna lay these down at the feet of Jesus. Now, I feel that there are many of us today, many of you today, who are carrying hate, carrying anger. My story is a gift for you, you right? I encourage you to lay down the venom, the abuses, the guilt, the shame, the hate, and the anger of your past or present. You don't have to hold it anymore, right? You can be free. You can give it to God. He wants to carry it for you. So I want to bless you now with the unburdening of your heart. I want to bless you with freedom. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Well, there's that, right? <laughs> you guys, well done. Good job. And I think all of our Emerge students have so many incredible stories to tell. I wish we could have had all 33 of them take five minutes and share their stories today. But thank you very much. And let's, let's take a minute and let's thank God. Let's thank God for breakthroughs over anxiety, through, for, for becoming the beloved of God and, and really knowing his love, for overcoming shame. That's incredible. Let's, let's pray together as we close. Father, we're so grateful for your power. You are so powerful. You break shame. You welcome us home when we're so far off. You, you destroy anxiety and you give us peace. And Lord, we're so grateful today for these stories and for the many other stories that we didn't have time to hear today of victory and overcoming. And Lord, we pray that these stories would touch lives in our city and lives around our country and even around the world uh, because your goodness and your grace is so amazing. Lord, thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.